Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere. There's also a PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Speaking of Patreon, I'm going to do a huge, massive, enormous shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to Guns of Navarone, RMP, Troy Shuka, Bose Nail, Justin Duso, Joseph Pizarro, Samson, Maris, Harry Blade, Mobile Mac 777, Neo The One, Lost Cut FE, Rob W, Open Minded, Reese Pounded, Reese Pounded, Reese Pound, <laughs> Dal West Watson, Mike, Muted, Dick Earth Skeptic, NA Literalist, Maria Neeland, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, Rob H, Nathan Thompson, The Real Gabster, Windrider, Liam Nedrick, Owen Jennisons, Abraham Mohammed, Dave Rocky Gafford, Nyby, Adrian Quintana, Skeptic936, Life is Short, Fireball X, Texas Mike, Edwin Johnson, Kirsten Smith, Alexander Main, David Wayne Foster, and Dank. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. I'll raise the mic on whoever is in Google Meet and Discord so you can enjoy their conversation while I set up for today's live show. Hello? Hello? Got your mouth full of food? Great way to start nah. my show. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hey, Flatsoid. Hello, how's it, how's going? it going? Just finishing off the tea. I just had to buy some... I just had to buy some data to be coming to today's show. Because I have some awesome news about what the Clovis claim Coriolis and Conservation Momentum is debunked by their own claim. Oh. Tell Thank me you, more. shout out to Conspiracy Cats and Wolfie. Fill us in, tell us more. They claim Yacht Foss effect. And for that to happen, well, I put a citation down in Master B for you. That claims that the Earth and you will be moving separate from each other. Not that they claim you have to move with Earth. So what is it? Yacht Foss effect or Coriolis? They have to decide. So th this effect, is it a naturally occurring phenomena? Not actually, because it's based on rubbish like gravit gravitometers and stuff. But oh, the citation oh, so says it quite clearly, if you are flying due east, you have to be going the Earth's 460 meters a second, plus whatever you're moving. If you do a U-turn, it makes you heavier, as they say, because you did a U-turn which goes totally against the claim that conservation of momentum. Right. I'll say it again. If this is a naturally occurring effect, then we can science it, right? Or is it just a mathematical, statistical claimed effect? It's a fantasy effect. I'm surprised Anthony's not piping up. He's actually been in live debate over the Boss effect on multiple occasions. I was just emptying my mouth. Nearly. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'd, yeah. I'll wait. <laughs> I'll wait. <laughs> yeah, Let's no, go back. Yeah, effect, the go thing on. is, the Atvos effect has to exist on their model, so they've got to they've got to put it in there somehow. So if you'd expect there to be an Atvos effect, and then you mathematize it so it into existence, then all of a sudden you've got one. But how do you demonstrate that there is the Atvos effect in real world? Let alone what causes it. You can't. D this is where Wolfie Slightly. 6020 piped in. He took uh, weights on a scale on a plane and it showed differences. But yeah, I'll make a video showing why it actually showed that because if you understand how the scale works, you understand why. Ah, but it, that sounds familiar. So something being weighed, this is a naturally occurring phenomenon, is it? Nope. So it's pseudoscience based on maths. Exactly. <clears throat> but not only that, though, when he does his weight test in his plane and he gets these different elevations or different uh, latitudes, longitudes, different location things, <clears throat> not, <clears throat> not only is that correlative only, <clears throat> there's other things that are changing whilst he's doing his thing. He's got different temperatures, different pressures, different humidities. There's different variables that he's not isolated and controlled. Yeah, if we were to do that, he would jump all over it and say, you haven't got any control manipulation. Your, your control variables aren't being controlled. Uh, hold on, hold so, on, hold on, hold on. 
Why would you need control variables, right? So you're talking about sciencing it then. So what first step, mm. right? What's the first step? Observe natural phenomenon. What's the natural phenomenon? Oh, there isn't one. So who cares about control variables? This isn't science. Well, the, if there was a naturally occurring phenomena, you would see that tankers that go from, like, I don't know, anywhere in the north, like, say, UK, that went down into the tropical waters near the equator, you'd see that they physically change their weight because they would be thrown off centrifugally and there would be an element of change. And we don't see that. But there needs to be on their model. Otherwise, it's not true. Yeah, this is what I've been trying to say. If they claim e force effect, they can't claim conservation of momentum because that requires you to be separate from Earth's rotation. Do you know what we do see, though, that contradicts their claim or their, their necessary antecedent, which will be the weight change of the boat because of the centrifugal effect? We do see something like changing the, the way the boat appears in the water that would give the same effect. And it's called the plimsoll line and the load line of the boat. We know that boats have got plimsoll lines and they've got different scales on them, depending on whether they're in fresh water or salt water, cold water or tropical water. And we can tell because we've had boats that were built historically, this is why the Plimsoll line exists, that were built in England, loaded up in England, sent down to the Caribbean, at some areas in the Caribbean area, and they were sinking en route because the water around the boat was changing its warmth, therefore increasing its volume, and therefore changing its relative density relative to the boat. And the boats were sinking, and they didn't understand why. And they realized it was to do with the density of the water and the solidity of the water and the temperature of the water. The boats were going out loaded and they were going beyond the load carrying capacity whilst the water around them was changing and the boats were sinking. So we know that that actually happens, right? Which would be the opposite of what would happen on their model because it should be getting lighter, but it appears that it's getting more dense and heavier as though someone's filling it with water. But it's not actually that that's happening, is it? It's the temperature of the water around the boat that's warming up. And that's changing the volume of the water around it, which increases the relative density of the boat relative to the medium. So that's directly contradicting the theory that Etmos effect is a thing, because we see the opposite in the real world, and Plimsoll lines are the proof. Not a theory. Yep. It's not a theory. And, and it debunks the assertion of buoyancy, because it is so just in that whole density. In that whole explanation there, Nathan, you picked up on the one slip of the tongue that I said to do with theory, and you never credited me at all for the con the whole el the contradictory evidence that we do see real world. Come on, that's a bit harsh. Not a theory. There's no scientific evidence for this. There's no observed phenomenon. So as much as I credit you for giving an alternative explanation for the disequilibrium of boat, given the density of the water that it's sat in based on temperature, that's admirable, but... They're the ones who are making the claim. They're the ones that have got to show us an effect. And they're the ones that have got to claim the cause of it. Well, it falls well, on its ass on. immediately when you claim science, which they do. Hang on. There is a naturally occurring phenomena that doesn't, that? Go, doesn't support the Etvos effect claim. Yeah, I gave boats you credit for that. Boats appear to sink. I gave you credit. Loaded boats heading away from the UK appear to sink when they get I into heard. tropical waters. I heard. I gave you credit for it. I said you, it's admirable that you've, all, you've given an alternative explanation. No, no, that's an alternative, an alternative naturally occurring phenomenon. Boats appear to sink. Loaded You're, boats heading from the UK I, I, I and understand that. waters appear to sink. I get that. I'm just saying that providing them with an alternative natural phenomenon isn't the purpose, right? Because they're the ones claiming it. So they need to come up with the phenomenon and then they need to verify the cause of it as opposed to you provide an alternative. Admirable though it is. I'm going to find some uh, Plimsoll line citations for Flatzoids so we can spit these back at them because it directly spits in the face of their arguments. Exactly. <laughs> New contradiction every day. So the day I get high winds and they turn off my internet, you guys talk about boats, one of my favorite <laughs> subjects. <laughs> yeah, we, we're just floating around. Ideas. Yeah, thank you. I want to know I, how come I didn't get a, a, what do you call it? Something to tell me the show started. What, like hey, an Neil, the show started. Yeah, I went to <clears throat> Skype, but I didn't see anything pop up. I usually get notified. Nothing today, like I don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie then. Good to have you, Neil. It's a conspiracy, Neil. It's a conspiracy against you. Glad you picked up How the How much invite. did I miss? Nothing. Very little. 
at boss effects being okay. claimed. It's been pummeled in the past. We're just reiterating it. Anthony's doing a very good job of describing it. Great. Oh, and by the way, Globus thing plates on containers now. Plates? Depends what a you're plate. containing. Yeah, a plate where you keep your food on is considered not a container now. Not a container? That's, I was going to say, if you're that, containing food that on is top the, of it. That is the mental capacity of the Globus. I see. Depends on what you're trying to contain, really. It needs to be a closed container if it's containing gas. Obviously, a plate can contain a liquid. You could pour a bit of liquid on the bottom of it and it would contain it. It still contains gas for a certain amount as, he, as well as heating on its surface. No, no it doesn't. But it's still going to dissipate. Yeah, that, a, that means not containing though. Dissipate means it's not contained. It's heating the surface. <laughs> contained for that split second. <laughs> so not contained then. <laughs> no, but it contains liquids and solids. Indeed. Yeah. I had to buy data. I just can't flip and live without the live shows. It's not the same listening to reruns every time. <laughs> so what was the takeaways from yesterday? Show anything important? Um, yes, Earth is flat. Space is fake. We do not spin. There is no Coriolis effect. No evidence oh, of a molten iron core. No evidence of the distance to the sun. No scientific validity given from any <laughs> field of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics. No scientific evidence for gravity. It was a very eventful day. <laughs> like every other day. Like tornadoes, Nathan, tornadoes. Yeah, I saw your video. So a gas pressure differential is what you'd describe as a tornado. It's got a difference in pressure. Where'd you get the gas pressure from in the first place? That's not the best. 100 photos, you choose one that's got just the anomaly and you cancel the 99 that's 100% proof. <laughs> Do you see <laughs> my maths. comment about that? That's some strange maths. So you get 99, you got 100 photos, one shows that it's not a globe. Let's say it's a black swan. You only need one to demonstrate that we don't have physical geometry. Nevertheless, this guy says, you ignore the other 99 photos, which are 100% proof. <laughs> Oh, so one one day out of 100 days, the Earth goes flat, and then the other 99, it goes round? Is that what you're saying? They missed the, the nuance of this black swan argument. You can't have a geometric horizon beyond a point of its physicality. So as soon as it's beyond that, it's no longer physical geometric, which is what they tell us. We no longer see a geometric horizon, and the rebuttal is we wouldn't expect to. We wouldn't expect to see geometry. The geometric horizon only exists in the maths. Nobody's claiming we see Earth curve as a horizon. Well, yeah, you do. It's on screen right now. There it is, marked with an X, labelled horizon. It's the physical tangent point that blocks the things in the distance according to you when you put it inside view. So, yes, your horizon is a geometric physical sphere edge if you believe you're on a sphere. You don't have one anymore. The black swan, you only need one, shows it's beyond what you claim is its physical capabilities as a sphere edge to block things in the distance. Once that's been dismantled... There's no going back. You don't need more than one picture to show that it's not a physical geometric sphere edge. One image has led to the, res the res uh, redaction of their claim in the first instance. We don't see the horizon as Earth curve. That's their primary claim. Until Tim Osman came and corrected us. Yeah, nobody's claiming the horizon is Earth curve. <laughs> <laughs> one of the best ever. Nobody's claiming that. Give it a couple of years and you'll be right. Good morning, guys. Hey, Chocolate. Hey, Chocolate. No, they're definitely claiming it now. It just, it just isn't a physical geometric sphere edge for a horizon. And we've proven that. And you've, uh, I keep saying rescinded, retracted that from your own side. So how often does the curve maths come up now? Well, never. Why? Well, because you haven't got a physical <laughs> geometric sphere edge horizon anymore. They argue all this time for Earth curve being the horizon, and now they have to argue against it. Beginning of the end. It was 2020, Jan 1st. That was the beginning of the end of the globe model. It's completely untenable. We've said it thousands of times now. So boats don't go over the curve anymore. They just vanish, or they just refract uh, away. Yeah, sometimes we're Why told it's they? optics. No, nobody claims that, apparently. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Our argument that it's optical is sometimes they're a rebuttal also. Well, it's optical. Oh, right. Not geometric then. The horizon is not physical. You can't go and put stick a flag in it. Mr. Sensible. <laughs> they go on and on. The quotes go on and well, on and on. They're finally catching up. Yeah, they think they're defending their globe model when they give us that concession. It's like, no, you, what you're doing is admitting that it's the end of your fantasy of standing on a spherical su surface. You don't. You only claim proof, see, of it was a physical sphere edge getting in the way of boats and buildings. And what's that you say? Nobody claims the horizon is Earth curve. Welcome to Flat Earth. We thought when the black swan came out that uh, it would have a certain effect. What it did was it made the ballers take up our talking points, and they still believe it's a ball after they take up our talking points. It's had an effect, but it's uh, psychological, I think, on them. A rough year for ballers. Obviously, on this side of the fence, we understand the validity that science can offer to certain claims that are made in the media, one of them being a sphere, others we won't mention. But that's been very... Uh, nice, shall we say. A nice little relieving detail that I've held true throughout the current nonsense of 2020. And it's really nice to know, ah, I don't need to concern myself with this pseudoscience they're punting as science because they don't have any scientific validity. They're just using the magic words to scare me. Now, if you're of the type that likes to buy into mainstream narratives listen to the pseudoscience pretender clown priests when they declare they've got scientific validity for something that they're asserting is true, well, then you're going to have a rough time of it, especially when it comes to the ball and it's demonstrably not true. And your own concessions tell yourself that it's not true. We don't see a geometric horizon. We wouldn't expect to see geometry. Nobody's claiming the Earth curve is represented by the horizon. Well, these are devastating claims, considering you've got maths that claims just that. And the arguments coming from your mainstream priests are it all starts with the horizon if you're going to claim Earth curve. So, bad deal for a globe Earth. A lot of them have expressed their cognitive pain over the last 12 months. So, are you saying now they don't care to show us the Muppet vision anymore because now they're admitting to perspective? Well, when they do, they get an absolute pummeling from multiple directions. So, you claim made shows a physical geometric sphere edge for a horizon capable of blocking boats and buildings marked with an X labelled horizon in the Earth curve maths by comparison with optical imagery from a high altitude balloon, everyone around you is going to say, uh, we don't have a geometric horizon. At best, you would have debunked the radius based on the fact we don't have a geometric physical sphere edge for a horizon. You want to claim that suddenly it's Earth curve again? Yeah, we've pummeled that. And everybody in the flat Earth community knows it. And they're all pointing it out. Uh, no. High altitude balloons don't suddenly show physicality to a horizon. No, it's not an edge when you go up high. It wasn't an edge down low. It's not an edge. The horizon is an earth curve. We've debunked it. Black swan. Well, that's why the black swan for both its iterations is so devastating, right? Because of the first notion of well, if your argument's all swans are white, all it takes is a black one to disprove that. And then there's the other uh, description of the black swan event, which is an unpredictable event that is beyond what is normally expected of a situation and has potentially severe consequences. And I think that's even more devastating, or at least on the same level because I think it's led them to a place where I don't think they expect it to be, which is where we are now, where they are declaring the same thing that used to be declared as blocking boats and buildings. Now we can't see, have never seen, can't possibly see, only exists in the math, and now nobody claims that it actually does what the claim says it does. So I think the Black Swan was even more devastating than we initially thought it to be. So I think that's why we are where we are right now. Definitely, definitely an unexpected event to have your opponent who's claiming that the horizon is Earth curve, capable of physicality, blocking boats and buildings, measurable with feet and inches values for the targets of how much they're blocked by its physicality. For them to turn around and tell us, we wouldn't expect to see geometry. 
The geometry only exists in the maths. Earth curve horizons only exist in earth curve maths. In other words, you don't see them. Or to be told that nobody claims that we would see a horizon that's earth curve. These are the unexpected repercussions of the black swan argument. The globe side telling us the horizon isn't earth curve. Very specifically, well, their claim. There's only one thing the black swan is doing for them, I must say. It's giving them their swan song for the ball earth. Yeah, this is the swan song for the ball earth. It's game over, globe. The model's untenable. We all know it. It's going to take you a while to keep up. And when you do, you'll have what Tim Osmond's found or Mr. Sensible's found that you somehow end up asserting that the horizon is Earth curve with your little proof C and have a hundred people tear you a new one and go, no, at best you would have debunked the radius or no, nobody's claiming Earth curves the horizon in your images, Timmy. Oh, you are? Oh, well, what a shock. So we have debunked them then with the black swan that you thought was some pathetic proof C and yet here you are telling us how the Earth curve isn't horizon. What a shock. Flat Earth Debate Live. I'm your host, Nathan Oakley, and if you are new to this channel, or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon, and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel. So please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. One last time, if you're new to the channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button to keep up to date with the Flat Earth debate. Now we are joined by Arwin, who's not going to know I've asked, actually admitted him, but Arwin, 10th man, Chocolate Saiyan, Flatsoid, Neil, Paul and Sleeping Warrior in Discord together with a whole bunch of people in G+, or the other way around as the case may be. Welcome, one and all. Hey, good, good morning. Shalom. Good morning, good morning. Any evidence of a physical, who's making that background noise, that's Arwin, isn't it? Or 10th, it's Arwin. Damn you. Any evidence of a physical geometric sphere edge, horizon formerly known as Earth curvature? Not from Washu Lake State Park. No, I'm not, not even the border. I not don't understand the border. why you would even ask such a thing. Nobody claims the horizon is the curve of the Earth. Yeah, they don't even claim it's physical. What about the Earth curve maths that has it marked as a horizon at the tangent point Earth curve <laughs> physical obstruction? That's not claiming it, no. No, no, you, you, don't, don't you, bring that up. Shh. You mean, you mean the maths that was destroyed by its own geometry? It's just optical, right? Yeah, you can't measure optical and claim it physical. Even the baller say that. Yeah, you wouldn't expect to see geometry. The geometric horizon only exists in Earth curve maths. Why would you expect the horizon to be an Earth curve when no one's claiming the horizon is Earth curve? Right, ballers? These are all quotes from ballers, by the way. Any evidence of axial rotation of the Earth-based variety? 
I uh, do have some evidence that completely refutes it. Feel free. I'm going to have to screen share though, Nathan. I'm sorry. Can you uh, present me if I screen share? Sure, that's not too difficult. Go ahead. Uh, where's the screen share button? Um, Down at the bottom. Where the hell is it? Present. Is that it? And present your screen, okay. And While you're doing that, shout out like to James now. Richards, who says, like the entire heliocentric religion, Earth Curve is only in your imagination. Thank you very much. Right, so I'm going to have a... I want to have a conversation with Flatsoid if I can. <clears throat> Flatsoid, are you there? Yes, mister. So I've been watching your discussion recently with uh, regards to the Airbus. <clears throat> Say again? Very I've been well, watching sir? your... No, no, I thought someone sp spoke over it. It's okay. I've been watching your progression with your conversation with regards to the Etvos effect and the claims that um, it proves that the Earth's turning, right? I, I want to present to you some opposing evidence that shows that the Earth is not turning because if the Earth actually was turning and if you start, like, if, if, you, if you're driving a boat or you're captaining a ship and you set off from the UK, which we'll call North Atlantic, uh, so winter North Atlantic, um, you can only load your boat up to the line that is presented on screen <clears throat> because of the density, <clears throat> the density of the water. And if you go beyond the density of the water line, by the time you get to your tropical dist your destination in the Caribbean somewhere, when you get into your summer tropical um, waters, effect it looks like your boat sinks. Right, because the water level rises further up, and that's because the density of the water around the boat is changing, and the boat is therefore displacing more. But the Etvos effect claims that as you get closer towards the uh, equator, that the boat essentially gets lighter in the water because it's being centrifugally flung around the ball as it's being um, as it's rotating. Well, if that was true, the, this this scale would be inverted because you would be able to set off from England with your heavily laden boat full of tea, if you want for a better stereotype, heading off to the Caribbean. And when you got to the Caribbean, because of centrifugal force, it would appear that the boat has risen out of the water because the water level has dropped. But in real world, it's the opposite way around. Now, I'm not asserting that there's a force of attraction pulling you towards the center of the earth as a function of getting towards the equator. But I am asserting that the water changes its relative density to the boat as a function of temperature and salinity. And we see that with, with proof with the, the Plimsoll line. So with regards to the claim that there is an axial rotation, if there was, you would expect the Etvos effect to make the water, this scale to be the opposite way around. Because as you're traversing from the, the winter North Atlantic down to the summer tropicals, you would expect the scale to be inverted and it's clearly not that way. Um, so this kind of disproves the idea that the Earth's rotating because this scale would have to be the opposite way around. So shout out to Samuel Plimsoll, the English engineer that built ships that were sinking, um, for working out that it was relative density that kept these boats afloat and had nothing to do with the Etvos effect. It's just an, a story that exists in their model because it's necessary. But in the real world, we can see that it doesn't exist because if it did, this scale would be the opposite way around and it's not. So shout out to Samuel Plimsoll. Flatsoid, what do you think? Yeah, first off, I never claimed it does have a spin. <laughs> I'm claiming you can't. Oh, no claim uh, your force effect or Corollas if you're claiming conservation of momentum because if you claim conservation of momentum you cannot have your force effect because then you're not going to have centrifugal forces pulling you opposite way to change your weight what what do you think of my claim that the scale on the plimsoll line would be inverted if we were sh sending ships from the from the winter north atlantic down to the caribbean to sell off our tea um, you would expect the boat to be centrifugally flung out of the water to some degree. And essentially, the water level would drop because you're getting towards the equator. But in the real world, it's the opposite way around. Would you agree with that? Or would you say that mm, it's correlative only? No, I agree. Because it's demonstrated and proven cool. that so, that happens. So let's the, let, let, let the ball tads explain why the Plimsoll line refutes the claim of the Etvos effect, because it does. Sorry, guys. Can you turn your mic down 5 dB? Yeah. Thank you. Any evidence of the distance to the sun? No, but can I ask Could Anthony you... a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, so what, we, what you're saying, you're citing a historical event of boats leaving England 
and sinking as they got to different waters that had different yeah, believe, salinity believe, and temperature, right? But be, believe it or not, tenth, it's it's a naturally occurring phenomenon that for some reason boats that were being built in Britain were only getting so far, and then they all appeared to be sinking when they were heavily freighted. And it's interesting that because it's like what's what's going on? Some it's weird naturally occurring as well. Boats were sinking all all in the same area. It's like did was were, were us Brits getting it wrong, building bad ships, or was something else going on? Well, we know that uh, the sun never set on the English Empire at one time, so they would be <laughs> <laughs> they would be building a lot of boats and going to a lot of different oceans. So based on that, uh, the boats they were building were having these effects happen to them when they hit different waters with temperature and salinity differences. Is that what you're stating? Sure. So okay. as the temperature increases that means the, the, the volume of the water also increases and therefore the relative density of the water around the boat changes. So it gets basically less dense, but the mass of the boat is still the same. So relatively speaking, because relative density is a thing, the boat appears to be lower in the water and it looks like it's been taking on water because it appears to be sinking. It's not actually sinking though, is it? It's the water around it that's getting less dense because of the temperature. Right. So once, once they had enough ships that sunk, they said something's going on here, and this Mr. Plimsoll guy figured it out, right? Yeah. And then they made the changes, and then the ships are no longer sinking, correct? Correct, yeah. Okay. That's it's pretty obvious. Thank you. Very good. And right, but it, it refutes the claim that the that the Etvos effect is a thing, because if it was the Etvos effect and it was an actually observed phenomena, the Plimsoll line reference, the gauge on the side of the boats would be inverted, but it's not. Ex explain the Etvos effect for it's, me, who doesn't fully understand I think they have to it. prove Earth spinning first, though, before they even claim the Etvos effect is a side effect of that. But anyway... The, the claim is as you get closer to the equator, whether you're traveling north or south, as you get closer to the equator, your vehicle or your thing gets lighter. Now, that works for boats as well, because boats should be appearing to get lighter as they're in water, but they don't. And we can test it and we can observe it does and that, we can verify does that go it. Does for the water the that it's in as well? Say again. Is the Things water just that get it's warmer in becoming get lighter as well? Oh, when someone's trying to respond. Hold on. Go ahead, Rams. Is is the water that the boat is traveling in uh, less affected by gravity as well? Or is it affected by these centrifugal forces well, somehow as well? well we know, the actual water. We know that water can't we know that water can't be affected by gravity because gravity itself is an effect. It's not a cause. So by definition, applying Einstein's theory, the current position in physics, we know that gravity can't be affecting the water around the boat because it's not a cause. Oh, and did you want to add something? Oh, that pregnant pause was beautiful. Why did you do that? Did you want to add something, Arwen? Uh, sure. I just wanted to say that the Advos effect is kind of like completely useless because it's claims about how the Earth is spinning and having these side effects when they can't actually prove that Earth is spinning because then there would be deviation because air is not susceptible my momentum it could never move in lockstep with so we would see all these side effects and therefore the claim of a side effect of the earth spinning is kind of useless because there's no proof the earth is spinning in the first place so oh, that are you saying yeah. the advance effect uh spokespersons are saying there's a 15 degree deviation no i think he's saying you'd first need to prove that there was spin and their claim proof of spin is deviation. So first prove deviation before you start talking about side effects of the spin that we don't see any effect of. Correct, Darwin? Correct. Moving on. Any scientific evidence of gravity? Ha. Huh. Reification fallacy. Well said. I think we should. I think we might want to change the question that you asked there, Nathan. Instead of saying any scientific evidence of gravity, just ask for any anybody on the ball Earth side even able to define it. Because that seems to be the problem. They don't like citing the Einsteinian current position in physics because it doesn't suit their, their model. But if they start with a definition, then the rest of their nonsense fails quickly. James Richards has a question. When measuring... 
a steel beam for a skyscraper, do they look to the stars to measure their cut? No, it requires a physical measurement. Thank you for the super chat, James Richards. Same thing here on the floor. It requires a physical measurement. I don't look up at the ceiling to cut my tile or my carpet or my vinyl. Yeah, but you often cut wrong, don't you, Neil? Oh, come on. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing with you. <laughs> any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? Not yet. Probably never. Because it's against what they're trying to achieve, and that is to reify a tradition of just so storytelling into science and then making people believe that they are right that science is a tradition of just so stories tied in together with some mathematical consistencies that's their main priority to reinforce that concept not actual science so uh, yeah they could but they probably never will because it's against their interest in the chat says nathan what's the black and white symbolism every effing show I have no idea what you're talking about. Maybe you give me more detail. It's not intentional. Any evidence you can have gas pressure without the necessary antecedent of a container to press upon? Tornadoes, Nathan. Tornadoes. The different. Think, what? Where'd you get the gas pressure from I in the first I'm... place? Yeah, tornadoes require gas pressure to exist. Yeah, to have a differential in the pressure that is pre-existing to create a tornado, you'd need a container. In other words... You can't have a gas pressure differential without a container either. Yep. How can you have volume without containment? But according to people like R.C. Meisty and Brenda, you just need gas to have gas pressure. As long as you have gas, gonna... you have gas pressure. Oh, press I, was just gonna say, just, I was just going to say, you can just draw out a volume and then calculate the, the volume and then apply the gas laws to it and then say that you've got a pressure. No. Um, I heard, it was but, it was the Professor Dave that said that. That's who said it. I'm going to go and find the clip. Okay, but you, but you volume, can't just draw an imaginary container you, and, and postulate. Sorry, but wouldn't volume me dictate you need physical containment? Yes, exactly. You can't just draw out an arbitrary imaginary line and say, well, the amount of pressure in this, well, what's the pressure? The pressure is the amount it presses. But it's not going to press on some imaginary container. So I was just going to ask, it's got a pressure on something, correct? Yeah, you can have gas without a container, but you couldn't have gas pressure because it has to press on something. Just, just ignore the pressing what? part of the pressure. Gas without a container? <laughs> no, you can't what? have gas pressure without a container. I thought... I thought you said, like, you can't have gas without a container, but you can't have gas pressure without a container. But I, I think I heard that wrong, right? The necessary pressure antecedent comes. for so gas. So you could have gas, but you can't have gas pressure without the container. Yeah, but well, gas false. pressure is what defines gas. If there's Very no gas right. pressure, there's no gas. Where's the gas? It's all gone. Exactly. Right. Gas is equated with pressure. Otherwise, you wouldn't have gas. Any more for any more on this? The sky is not a vacuum, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, despite this little internal semantical discussion. If the sky was a vacuum, the gas we breathe would fill the space. Oh, Paul Hall's presenting. Adam's trying to get in. It's all go. Did you want to present to me, Paul? Got it up for hey, you. Hey, Adam. Hold on a second, Darwin. Hi, guys. Hey, Adam. Hello. Yeah. What's up, Dad? Yeah. I've got to disagree with that one. You, you've still got the gas, it's just not able to exert any pressure. Now, the pressure is defined by once you, once you contain the gas, then the net effect of containment of gas is to generate pressure within the gas. You don't, don't have, not have the gas. If the, you go to imaginary land and the, you've just got one particle and you've not really got gas and you've not really got any real pressure, have you? You've got a vacuum. But, it's the containment of the gas and the way that that containment uh, creates the molecules to behave and rebound that creates the pressure. But, but, Adam, but then it's you, a hypothetical got... situation because you can't have gas pressure without a container because there's no place where there is no containment. 
got yeah, but the, the statement. Oh, hold on, hold on. I've got flat side's mic wide gaps, open. Right. Hello, hello. Hold on. Go ahead, flat side, because you just kept causing everyone to echo. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just saying, if you got a gas molecule, gas is always moving, so you would have to have containment to have the gas. If it's always moving, it's just going to move away. You won't have it anymore. Yeah, I think that's his point. Go ahead, Adam. If it's, if it's moving without containment, it won't return a pressure. So you wouldn't have gas. Well, you wouldn't have gas pressure. You wouldn't have the gas either because it'd be moving Oh, he's away. agreeing with me. Oh, oh, that's nice. Oh, th thank you, Adam. I just realised what's happening. You're agreeing with me. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a semantical argument, but it is, it is defining what it is. The pressure is derived. You could still have gas. You can't say you can't have gas without the, the pressure because you could have just one gas molecule. Now, but that's a statement know. that could never be proven, though, because there is no way to demonstrate gas pressure without containment, because there is no place where there is no containment that exactly. can be demonstrated. Yeah, I think it would be impossible to demonstrate my point. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah, I mean, you would agree that to see, to have gas, you need a volume, and volume needs containment. So. No, to have gas pressure, you need a volume. To have no. a gas, you don't. Yeah, I that's the difference I'm drawing. You can't have nothing in the, in the space of nothing. You can't have something in the space of nothing. That contradicts itself. Okay, just, just for brevity. The sky is not a vacuum, and the point of this discussion is that there's an assertion that the sky is a vacuum, and that would be an availability of volume for the gas pressure we definitely have, regardless of how we define it, whether or not we've got gas and gas pressure or gas pressure that can only exist with the container that's the necessary antecedent. The point is the sky is claimed to be a vacuum, outer okay. space. And outer space, if it was a vacuum, would mean that all the gas we're breathing would be filling it. And we wouldn't have any gas anymore. It would rapidly expand in all directions to fill the availability of space that it has to fill, as per the second law of thermodynamics. You can't have gas That's pressure. Without, you can't have gas pressure without a container. Yeah, we would still be producing gases at lower level if in this imaginary scenario. You're still going to produce the gases, but there'll be no containment. So off they go into the the, the void because there's no containment. So you wouldn't get a gas pressure because once they've got a away from the earth vector they're gone uh, so they, there's no return there's nothing to generate for, the pressure. for them so, to press yeah, so on exactly anymore. there's nothing for them to press yeah. upon you've still got a gas being released at that exactly. point but it's not going to generate a pressure but but adam where the gas is released you would say it's it's coming from containment yeah, but that's I mean, his whole point. You, yeah. you, you, you have gases surface. being released. So you have gas, yeah. you just don't have the pressure. Yeah, yeah but it has you won't to have the gas there very nothing long because you don't have containment. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the whole point. But that's the thing. It comes from an actual surface, which then would be a container wall. It's, it's come from a container, hasn't it? It's yeah, come from within the cell. So it left the container where it had containment and was pressurized, and then you release... Uh, and once it's then in the bigger volume, which if it doesn't have containment, it can only go one way, and that's continuous, isn't it? So it wouldn't. So it still then proves my point. You cannot have any gas without containment because the gas comes from containment. No, it's still a gas. It's just not generating any pressure anymore because it's continuing in one yeah, way. Where did the gas found. come from? Adam, where did the gas come from? Out of thin air? A, chem a chemical reaction. From a surface, correct? Well, from, from a chemical reaction, yeah. Um, it may I have, have a philosophical question. If you cannot measure gas, then does it really exist? Yeah, yes, Adam's I'm start, point I'm is that... To oh, really? That How would you know? Guys, you hello, can I just take control? Because Adam's made his point twice. I just want to concisely summarise it, especially as it's my point originally. <laughs> so the gas could off... You could have off-gassing, right? The rocks give off a gas. But because it's never hitting anything, it's never developing any pressure... So it's still a gas, it's just not at pressure. Simple. But if you can never yeah, measure it, then how would, you be, how would you be in the know that it is even a gas if there's no way to measure it? Okay, you've got me there. Look, in this we, scenario, we are, <laughs> right, okay, in Arwin's scenario is asking how, if we are at 10 to the minus 17 tor at sea level because the sky is a vacuum and a little bit of oxygen happens to be released from wherever, right? How do you know that it's being released? Well, we wouldn't. We'd all be dead. 
None of us would be breathing in this scenario, Arwen. So all containment right, that's, required. That's the more existential consequence of that, of course. But yes. You know, you have to have containment in order to even measure gas pressure in order to establish that it's actually there. So if there's no containment for you to for the gas to build up pressure in order for us to register that it is there, then how would you ever know that there even is gas? See, Indeed. That, that, that was my question. No, I get it. But Adam, unless you want to add anything, Sleeping More is presenting. I'm done. I'm done. Thank you. Just two things before we go to this clip. Um, when gas pressure or when gas molecules have hit the Earth and they've bounced away from the Earth and all directions are space, what seems to be the argument from their side is that as the gas molecules cool, they lose kinetic energy and that acts as a break so that basically it turns the molecules around and comes back to Earth. But that's a false, that's not true. Now, the reason why I say it's not true is because Newton's first law of motion states that an object in motion will remain in motion unless acted upon by a force. Well, we know gravity is not a force, and we know that kinetic energy reduction or removal of the kinetic energy, which is basically the acceleration, if you take the acceleration away from the molecule, it's not going to slow down. It's going to continue on its path. So if you remove the force that's giving it the energy, um, like the heat, if you remove the heat from the molecules, that's not going to put the brake on. It's not going to turn the molecules around. It's not going to bring them back to Earth. It's just going to stop them accelerating. So they will maintain their velocity in a spaceward direction unless Summit turns them around and brings them back to Earth. Now, what that Summit might be, they need to demonstrate. And we know that it's not even a force because it's, it's, it's an effect. But remember Newton's first law of motion. An object in motion, a gas molecule in motion, will remain in motion unless acted upon by a force. Second point, I'm about to play a little clip here from Professor Dave. Now, it's only a couple of seconds, and I'll tell you what he says before he says it, and then you can hear what he says. He basically can I says... Add, Tony, before you just, just, just correct a little bit there. You, you, well, you use the words accelerations. When we're talking about gas behaviour, there isn't. They've got a constant speed, which is defined by PV equals NRT. Um, so the pressure, the volume, the and, the, and, the re and it's the relative temperature that affects that kinetic energy level. That's done in Kelvin, so you never get two or zero. So you're always going to have a speed. It's never going to get to zero unless you get to zero degrees Kelvin, absolute zero, which is an impossibility. So they will always have some kinetic energy. If you look at the formula PV equals NRT, there's no acceleration. They may change speed if you add more energy into the system. That'll increase the kinetics. But they're not. it's not a acceleration that's related to in gravity accelerations. They just have a speed, which is based loosely on the... the, the, the the energy levels of the system they're in, which is their energies and all their... So mates. correct me if I'm wrong here, if the sun excites the molecules to make yeah. them travel faster or accelerate, if you yeah. remove the sun or the temperature away from the molecule, it's not going to put the brake on. It's just going to remove that, that excited force that pushes no, no. it faster. Right? No, no, no. You missed the intricacy of the detail that was critical. The, the system that it is in. Can you expand on what you mean by the system that the gas is in, please, Adam? Yeah, so it's, it's the environment, then it's the containment in which containment. It's and that, there it is, yeah. um, and it's that particular part of the dynamic system that will, with with regard to PV equals NRT, which will define the energy level, the kinetic energy of, of the molecule and its friends. Um, but say fundamentally, if you use that, then you're using K uh, the, uh, uh, as, as a Kelvin. Right, and so you'll never get to zero. So they're always going to have a level of energy, which which is the point of contradiction of the. I think what you're talking about the bullet going up and returning to Earth is a analogy for a molecule. Yeah, you never get to recover. Yeah, I just wanted to make the point clear that the removal of any kinetic energy doesn't bring the the molecule back to Earth because it requires a force to bring it back to Earth, according to Newton's first law of motion. But we know that they've not got a force, but they say that they've got the removal of kinetic energy. That's not going to slow it down. It's just okay. it's going to fail. It's just that, gonna that's it. a really good point, Tony, as well. Yeah. Uh, if it's continuing up, it's only continuing up and then running out of energy to continue continuing up. There's no yeah. return. They're not saying that, that suddenly it turns it round. Is it? Because where's the force that turns it around to make it go that way? Then you've yeah. already you've well, already done it. You've, you've, yeah. Adam's already yeah, described is... where they use a false analogy or whatever the false equivalence. So the bullet, a solid traveling through gas, will run out of what is being described in this example as kinetic energy and then come back down again. Whereas a gas p 
particle doesn't behave like that. It just keeps on going, and if it does hit something, it doesn't gain or lose energy. It has an elastic collision with the walls of the container so that you can make any of these maths work. In other words, to actually qualify all of these things, you've got to have a system to be measuring. Now, Anthony's trying to use this example in a systemless example where you've got a force that creates this collision with the wall of container to make it change direction. But that doesn't happen. Gas does not do that. This is, and this is when I point out why they why claim that when they say gravity, it, it actually goes against the thir, uh, law of entropy because they are claiming gravity is overcoming entropy, the increase exactly. of entropy. Precisely. They're claiming yeah. a defiance of the law of entropy, a natural law, something that's just being described because it occurs always with this reification fallacy of gravity making gas behave in a way it doesn't behave. Uh, 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 sleep, sleeping Warrior's been waiting for a while to, to play this Professor Dave clip. Feel free, you're on screen, it's yeah. all queued up, I noticed. So the point here is that Professor Dave held, holds himself in a position of self, self-righteous self esteem, right? And and because he's a teacher that he calls Professor in America, not, not a university professor, a teacher, he he's held up there as high as somebody as, as magnificent as conspiracy cats, for example. Now, we know that we need co like collisions with the walls of its container to get pressure. Now, listen to what this gentleman says here when, when he's, he's dealing with Professor Robitaille. Um, what's Robitaille's first name? Is it, is it, oh, it's not, I can't remember. Pierre, yeah. Pierre Robitaille. Now, this guy holds a PhD and he's, he's considered to be one of the world's leading authorities, right? But he's, he's not arguing with a dumb flat earther. But earlier in the conversation, he's compared him to a flat earther. And listen to how he now describes how we get pressure. And it's, I'm going to play, I've played it in a little bit slowly so you can hear it. He literally says you can calculate pressure into existence. Listen to what he says. Inside the sun. When we talk about pressure as being some force applied over an area, it's just any hypothetical area. It doesn't have to be a literal solid surface. We can construct a... Sh so he thinks that you can have a hypothetical area to get pressure. You can just magic pressure into existence just by thinking about what? it. No, try no, no, <coughs> no, he's, uh, uh, hold on. What he's doing is he's describing how he can calculate hypothetical <laughs> gas pressure on paper with the abstraction of maths, with the language of maths. Describing it mathematically is absolutely possible without a container. But show it me in reality now, Professor Dave. Show me gas pressure without a container. And be feel free to say, oh, well, there's a hypothetical container around it. And then watch how it doesn't contain anything. Correct. But, but even in their maths, they still need a boundary, though. So it's still... Containment. Yeah, they need the boundary, yeah. Now, it is the thing, right? He's not talking with um, a flat earther like me or Nathan. He's talking to Pierre, um, Pierre Robitaille, right? Somebody considered... And at the end of this conversation, I'll show you where it comes from. Basically, Robitaille basically smacks his bum professionally. He says that he's not helping science by misrepresenting science the way that he does. And he says that he oversimplifies everything to make his points. And I completely agree. But if you do want to see where this video comes from, if you go to his channel, it's Sky Scholar. And you can see the name of it. Pierre Marie Robitaille debunks Professor Dave. 40 minutes long. The middle segment here, this period here, is absolutely brilliant on this point. So do go away and watch it. It's fantastic, guys. He, he double speaks a bit in it. I brought it up a few weeks ago. I think you shared it a couple of weeks ago, Tony. And I brought it up on the show then. It's... The point he's smashing Professor Dave on is he's saying, yeah, 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 you can have gas pressure on the earth without containment because we've got a solid earth <laughs> ground that creates a partial pressure and then goes off into fantasy land as to what happens at the top. But he's slapping <laughs> Professor Dave on that point by saying, but that's an impossibility for stars because they don't have that solid base to even begin the pressure to try to allow gravity to hold it in place afterwards. There's no solid base in the middle. So... That's why he's saying that the theory that stars are balls of gas has to be incorrect because you can't generate any gas pressure. Unlike yeah, the theoretically. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It's not a theory. So again, from the off, if people were a little bit more educated in what is and isn't science, they'd recognise that when he said the theory of stars being gas in a vacuum, not expanding to fill the volume because of a reification fantasy of gravity, 
is merely their way of transposing their belief into physical actuality and defying the second law of thermodynamics with just so stories of gravity. Well, does he not realise that the gravity isn't overcoming entropy, as pointed out by Flatsoid earlier? Why is he double speaking? I mean, it's your point, Adam, but feel free to carry on. Let me let me respond. Let me respond. He's double speaking because he's simply turning a blind eye to the same rules that he's... Oh, we lost you, Anthony. Oh. Oh, but don't you think it's amazing that Pierre was very highly acclaimed in things in the scientific... He was even a di director at university until he gave his paper against the sun being not a gas, and now he's seen as a joke, apparently, all of a sudden. Can I jump in? He, he dared to go against the rhetoric? So, yeah, this exactly. I don't concern myself too much with. What, because, yeah, exactly. So that's not a shock, even though he's... Who's making that row? Paul. It, because he's gone against the rhetoric, suddenly he's being demonised? Yeah, what a shock. That doesn't surprise me in the slightest. But if, if you've got any sort of gumption about you you'll look at it in isolation and make your own judgment call based on the evidence that's presented by him and also pull apart the failings of his claims as adam's done in other words don't worry about what consensus says oh suddenly he's not he's not a credible source because society says he's disagreeing with society well yeah that's what happens when you disagree with mainstream rhetoric you get demonized and he's going to find it no different well the people who stand up to it change the world we live in well, I find funny that now they're arguing amongst themselves and even comparing each other to flat earthers. So apparently this has been a little bit more significant than they all thought. <laughs> but that's the good thing. that You've got, you've got um, Professor Day there kind of calling, I like as Chocolate says, kind of referring uh, to Robital as a, retarded like retarded as flat earther but what robital comes back with in their paradigm is to demonstrate that actually it's not it's not him that's got a lack of understanding that he's exceptionally well qualified speaks exceptionally well on the subject and carefully goes through and destroys professor dave's argument demonstrating that he's oversimplified and incorrect and shows a complete lack of understanding in, uh, and any depth in the field and this is why he's wrong so that's why it's good fun because you don't you're not yeah. in flat earth world you've just got this idiot that's trying to pretend he can speak the rhetoric of modern science and when he does he demonstrates that he doesn't even know that as Rotel. yeah i think that's the best does. part yeah like he's literally getting called out right so what we're just saying is he's getting called out by his own side off of claims that he's made in in trying to uh rebuttal a flat earth or flat earth claims is that is that basically what's going on right here because i didn't watch this so i i don't know i'm only gathering what your guys is talking about yeah yes my my perception is same thing happens on our side when a flat earther goes out there and says something that isn't demonstrably provable but says it anyway, and then we hear about it on this show, and then we say, wait a minute, where'd you get the proof for that? And then we correct them from the position of demonstration right. or the lack thereof. Now, if we flip it to what's happening here, we got a trench level baller, Professor Dave, doing the same thing, and then one of the upperclassmen, this Pierre fella, comes and says, no, you got it all wrong. This is how it works on the sphere globe. <laughs> this is how it works in our heliocentric model. And then he corrects him in, in, the, in the proper way, but he's still wrong because he still believes in the heliocentric globe model. Isn't that That's funny, thing. though? Don't they have a, one beautiful unified model? <laughs> all no. encompassing. Uh... <laughs> well, all they, all they have is a portable tangent plane that they use every time they want to take any kind of real measurement or angles to navigate by. And then they fold up that portable tangent plane and say it's a ball whenever it's, you know, it's needed like a, to. It's like a folding table. <laughs> yeah. It's called a datum. Yeah, it is, that's perfect. It's called a datum. Datum. Perfect. Folding table datum. <laughs> Perfectly portable. With a handle. Take it anywhere <laughs> you like. At the bottom of the globe, at the side of the globe. It works every time. 
Paul, Paul, I know you were trying to speak. I'm sorry, but go ahead. Uh, I'm just going to try to be a little bit of a defense for the Globers. But if you think about the formula for gas pressure, it would only measure an instant in time, a perfect moment. Like you can't measure, if you wanted to put it outside a container, you have to put time in the equation. Because, you know, cause of entropy, um, it's a function of time. So, yeah, you can say at this instant, there's pressure here. But because there's no containment over time, that pressure would dissipate. So they really, that's what they should be saying. So any measurement they give, they say, well, I can measure a volume of air pressure, um, even though there's no containment. But there's a function of time involved. Over time, that will dissipate. So that's, that's, the, that's I don't want to argue I want to make. That's what they should be saying. Yes, you're correct. Well, instant. that when they when they try, try and attempt to show that in physicality, they'll show gas pressure without a container in a container having come from a second container, and they'll show that with an opening in the container, it doesn't immediately dissipate. And as Paul points out, well, the entropy increase based on the limited exposure to the outside air will mean that it will still expand in all directions to fill the availability of volume, but it'll take longer because it's got a small opening to get through. So therefore proportional to time has to be taken into consideration response from qe when hillbilly blue balls the redneck retard first presented gas pressure without a container in two containers was to say yeah come back a day later do you think the butane's still going to be in your pipe no it's proportional to time entropy increase will still take place i don't think they're being i don't think they're in, certainly in that calculation i don't think they're being that genuine um you look at what robital was saying there He's saying you can calculate it uh, based on a theoretical thing. And what, what they're basically doing there is there is they're pre-assuming that containment magically happens and they're going into the world of their presumptions, going to a particular depth level of the sun, making another presumption and making a statement that the sun is this dense in gas at this point, and then from that statement, back calculating the pressure based on the pre-assumption already that there's X amount of molecules in this amount of space. That's all they're doing. They're saying at this layer of the sun, the density is this, of it, and this means the pressure must be this. And it must be this because we know it's a ball of gas. It's all presumptive based on that. They're not actually measuring any pressure. They're just pretending they know what the concentration of the molecules is at a certain level. And then calculating it based on that. That's just bunker, isn't it? Yeah. But the the main overriding aspect to this is the containment. And it was summarized by the clip that Sleeping Warrior played from Professor Dave. Well, we can create a hypothetical chamber for the gas to be in. Well, no, because hypothetical chambers don't contain gas. In reality. So I have hypothetically in a hypothetical world they would contain the gas. Yeah, on paper, in maths, you can calculate it based on a hypothetical container. And you can say, well, the hypothetical container, in my example, doesn't have any walls. I'm just going to take an area, a size of amount of volume, and say it doesn't have containment. But I'm only going to calculate what happens within that specific area, even though in reality, if I had a specific area with gas in it, it would just expand in all directions to fill the availability of the container it was in. But hypothetically, Sorry, I but can ignore that. Have... But volume, you cannot have volume without containment, so that would be a contradiction anyway. Exactly. So you're going to have a hypothetical volume. Well, in reality, you can't have hypothetical volumes without containment. There's always one part in the conversation where we all revert, revert back to like pictures from space or whatever looking down, and they always say, well, why does all the gas seem to pool at the bottom? And my answer to that is, it's just like looking into the tank of sulfur hexafluoride where it's all based on the floor. It's got to be inside a tank, though, on it, and it's got to be sealed. So essentially, like, they always infer that gravity is pulling the gas pressure back down and I completely ignore the fact that you can also interpret that to, to be looking into the sulfur hexafluoride tank, but you can just see it, whereas you can't see it in the sulfur hexafluoride without the little boat on it. So just they just they can't see the other argument. They can only see gravity, but they can't see the fact that the, that there is an alter equal and alternative explanation for it. Can you restart your desk? Do you have to do that? Yeah. I don't know if there's something something going on with your mic. Done. I don't know what it is. It sounds distorted. Anyway, any evidence of a self-perpetuating molten iron core at the center of a presupposed spherical Earth? Heat waves and S-wave diagrams, isn't it? 
You tell yeah, me. But what, they've all been disproven. What are they? Every step of the so, way. So it's only a theory that that actually works or yields some kind of proof. Isn't it yeah, amazing? A theory. Theory. Would it be a scientific theory? Would it? No, a colloquial would theory. Uh, would it be? A, wouldn't it be amazing that nobody can go past twelve kilometers, not under the sea, not under the ground, nowhere. It's like it has some kind of limitation. Well, limitations so far have only been derived from just the inability to go deeper and all that. So the Mariana Trench, I think, is the deepest thing out there. And yeah, I don't think they've really tested like the. I don't think they've drilled the bottom at the Mariana Trench or anything. So I don't. I mean, we don't know, do we? But I think limitation implies something i think that's it's as far as we've been is 12 kilometers now they might have had troubles but just because a drill bit down an old let's like say a couple of inches wide gets stuck to me doesn't necessarily mean you can use the word limitation i don't know so as far as we've got is what i'd say yeah tungsten carbide's Thanks, limitations is at 12k yeah. it can't cut any deeper it's too hard for whatever reason on that particular location. So you're talking about the entire world versus what a four inch borehole. And based on that, you're gonna say that, oh, well, that's as far as we can go. Well, we don't know, but we don't know, as opposed to molten iron core at the center of a presupposed spherical earth. Well, based on our technology, it's limited. Yeah, well, like with most well. things. In that hole at that particular spot, foot wider, it might go further. You don't know. They didn't try. Exactly. Hole to hell, they call it. Well, I think if their predictions didn't work going just about eight miles, I think they definitely were going about 4,000. Yeah, it seems legit. Oh, well, you can extrapolate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, just carry the one and... <laughs> Everything is good. Right. Even then, I say so that. It's actually well, wait, I, the hydrogen I, mud core. I was just going to say, sense. you can't I, really I, extrapolate. I How do you extrapolate from digging down and, and failing to get any further to self perpetuating molten iron core? You can't extrapolate out to that. I figured, figured out why they can't. I figured out why they can't go deeper. That's what I was going to get out of that. The only thing that's interesting with that for me and at the point of curiosity is that we've not bothered anymore. In any way, nobody else is bothered. Why? Why stop? Why stop trying? So it would seem a very easy thing to continue doing in multiple sites, but right? there's nothing more. Like, stop. Yeah, like where's the ten mile hole, and then the the fifteen mile hole? You know, like progress, guys. Oh, if you're the, after the, a maybe we destroyed that technology. It's painful process <laughs> to bring it back. <laughs> it's too painful. If if they claim, like the Foucault pendulum has precession because Earth rotates underneath, if you're going to stick a drill bit so deep in the hole for how many hours, don't you think the Earth would be hitting against it? Uh, again. They claim that precession happens because of the Earth rotation, like the Foucault pendulum. Now, if you're putting a, a drill bit down a long hole for many, many hours, wouldn't it also be showing for precision then? No, you're attached to the non-inertial reference frame, even in their example, it would make no difference. Like drilling an hole through the roundabout as you're spinning, isn't it? You're fine. Well, unless yeah. you go through the bottom Guess of the roundabout so. and reach something that isn't spinning, but that isn't what they're suggesting. Yeah. So, no, sorry, Flatsoid. And Globers and Discord. Hey, the uh, Globers and Discord will only give a two-bit answer to this question. <laughs> oh. Here we go. <laughs> you, yes, Tent, you your blunt answer again. <laughs> You're very sharp today. <laughs> I have a day off, Adam. <laughs> sharp as tungsten. Any evidence of the R value? Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> Yeah, did you want to add to <laughs> R. No. I was going to add a pun, but you 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 cut me off, so. Oh, no, feel free. 
<laughs> it's late now. It's too late. I was going to say 10th is like a drill sergeant. Boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> That was well a worth it. Thank you. I take that as corporal punishment. Terrible. <laughs> it's ruined. You can't, you can't it's have the puns, dude. Because it's the only things keeping our minds sharp. Because the ballers don't anymore. <laughs> I <laughs> like the sharp one. Adam. You used it twice very well. <laughs> but that, that is to, something to, to be got... honest. Some of Tenth okay. Man's puns are actually harder to figure out than the ballers' arguments. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> It's screwing around, guys. We did actually. We did discuss this on yesterday's show. That was something we did discuss. So, as a car, as a consequence of there being very limited argumentation to have to overcome on the globe side, we're having internal discussions currently. Which uh, I discussed this with Wits. It gets it actually in yesterday's uncut and after show, the brand new show that went out on my second channel yesterday, and Bob Nodell and Wits. It were both in there. And both me and Witsit were both of the same mind, which is try and keep these keep these animals off each other. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, it was pointed out that this is progress. You know, it's basically us discussing amongst ourselves where till now there's never an opportunity to do it. There's always something to discuss. There's always some bullshit claim that we've got to actually overcome or discuss or detail or whatever. Whereas where in the last five years have we been in the privileged position to just chat amongst ourselves without any concern whatsoever that there's some more important underlying claim that the Western world suddenly been exposed to that needs to be debunked? It's just not it's just not the case in 2020. Right. The, the well, argument for in the in the first point, which is the Earth curve is the horizon, is dead. So here we are in the trenches, sat around having a brew, chatting amongst ourselves. It's ace. I couldn't be well, more happy. Well, Nathan. Honest. Nathan, if the globe is in, do you think we ever get any any answers anywhere? I mean, look at the conversation we've had. We've gone into more detail with just gas pressure alone, just with this in what, a half an hour than a year's worth of globe is talking. Yeah, but talking drill bits is less boring than talking to these ballers. <laughs> <laughs> boring. <laughs> Absolutely. Boring. Marvelous, that one. Absolutely. You hammered that one. <laughs> I guess there's no evidence of the R value, I take it. Nah, bro. It's 2020. Definitely not. They don't, they don't got R, they don't got physicality to their horizon. As a matter of fact, did you hear Tim Osman claim? Nobody claims the horizon is Earth curvature. Did you hear that one? I, was I, think, that was I think the Flat Earth uh, Awards at the end of the year should give Adam Meekin a hole-in-one award. <laughs> say, again. say again, Chris. Yeah, ch chocolate. I heard you say that, but they still act like they have a winning argument. Say again, Chris. Go ahead. Good. No, I was just answering Chocolate's question. Yeah, I heard. I heard the Tim Osmond thing. I think. It, I think I heard it live too. But I, I really re-listened to it at least twice. It's, it's so funny. And to say Boy. that Globers have never claimed that the horizon is Earth curve is is insanity. We have three or four years of clips of them saying that, and they've only recently changed it because of the black swan, which Tim was trying to say wasn't even a big deal. So he didn't even realize he was debunking himself with the thing he was saying wasn't a big deal. It was, it was ironic and hilarious. Bro, Tim Bro, himself has four pictures. years of clips at the same time that he's declaring that he's posting pictures like, look, I got earth curve in my horizon pictures. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, that's the thing. I was I was biting my lip listening because no one specifically asked him, or maybe you did. I missed it or I forgot. Well, Tim, in that picture, what is blocking the bottom of your of the buildings in your in your photo? You're trying, you know, if it's oh, not I definitely or... definitely did ask him that. I'm just going to read out a quick chat comment from Sage Double One Two Three. It says I recall an old joke. There's an old farmer talking to his son. The farmer asked what his son learned at the fancy school that the farmer was paying for. Farmer's son replied, he learnt pi r squared. The farmer then smacked his son on the back of the head and said, You are stupid, son. Pi's are round, not square. <laughs> Thanks, Sage123. I have a oh, gravity often, question. You, just before you get oh, lost, oh, I was oh, hold on, flat side. Go ahead, Chris. What's your gravity question? Well, is Anthony here still? I yeah, yeah, Anthony's here. Yeah, yeah, me. So when you did your experiment, I mean, you know, I guess let me ask you this way: Is there, is there, a, what's the relationship between density and buoyancy? Because people are always claiming it's density, the, the change in value of density, but but 
I think we all agree density isn't a force, but we all agree buoyancy is. So why can't we simply say if if the force of the buoyant if the buoyant force is strong enough, you'll get an upward vector, and if it's if it's too weak, you'll get a downward vector. Why why can't we simply why isn't it that simple? Okay, so first off, the word buoyancy relies on gravity being a force in their model, and we know that gravity is not a force, so that means buoyancy within their model can no longer work. So we need another way of describing it because we know gravity is not a force, right? If if you accept, if you claim that density itself is not a force, I agree. However, when you have two densities competing for the same space, trying to occupy the same space, one will give way to the other. <clears throat> And that's demonstrable. We can repeat it very easily by repeating that my, my, my egg test. You've got the egg and you've got the water and they're competing for the same contained space within the glass. Now, one of them has to give way. And at the beginning, the egg's on the floor. Add a bit of salt to it. You can lift it off the floor because you're changing the density of the layer around it. But because we can't call that buoyancy because that relies on gravity being a force, it means that we've got to call it somewhere else. So we coined the phrase relative density because you've got two densities next to each other competing for the same space and one of them will give way. And we know the cause of that giving way, pr that process is mass. The, adding the mass changes the relative density of the liquid. So the egg is displaced. That's what happens. Now the argument against it is, well, it's just point density buoyancy. And it's not, that's a complete misrepresentation because if it's as simple as uh, density and buoyancy, you're inferring that gravity is a force. So it can't be um, density buoyancy. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Uh, that's a good answer. I guess um, I forgot that they had little g in there. But again, little g is is sort of strange, right? Because you can you can sort of swap it out for, for sometimes weight um, or acceleration. So this says the buoyancy force Point force equals fluid density times acceleration. So it says acceleration due to gravity. Yeah. So can you swap it out and just say acceleration or, or weight? That's what they mean when they say weight. They mean gravity. The, the two cancel out within the buoyancy stuff, don't they, the Gs, anyway? So they are just demonstrating a, a differential or, and comparison in, in the relative densities. It's kind of what it's doing. If, because both the water and the egg are multiplied by 9.8. So they just so so they work it on a constant then. Yeah, yeah net force zero. Into it, but yeah. as far as I thought, I thought it cancelled out, but I, I could be wrong. But I thought it was a kind of in and out equation, and it just then looks at the the differentials in the densities. That's correct. When it's at equilibrium, they say it's net force zero. Gal yeah. Grab, yeah, basically, you're right. So then, ultimately, <laughs> Anthony, I mean, in your opinion. So that either means density is a force or something, you know, what's the explanation for how you density. got the egg to move if, if you're saying it is density, a change in density? Density, density is not a force. Density disequilibrium, right, for it to be in disequilibrium means a, a force has been applied to it already, whatever, heat, what can it, it doesn't matter, to take it out of disequilibrium. Now, the, the system itself will want to return back to that equilibrium, even though you've put in some false energy to take it out of. That, the, the, out of equilibrium. That's why it's in density disequilibrium. Oh, I'd, I'd, I'd describe it. What you're saying there is if you're keeping everything else the same and you're putting it back to the position it was in before. If His question was if density is not a force, da 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 da. Density itself isn't. Density is just a measurement. But what, like I said, when you've got two things that are competing for the same space inside a cup, for example, the there's going to be a displacement because me and Nathan stood on the same spot. We can't occupy that same space. So one of us is going to move. Now, because one of us is moving, that relative density value is one of us starts to move. That means there's disequilibrium because it's caused by something, right? And that disequilibrium causes an acceleration. And I demonstrated that. But density alone isn't a force. But relative density and disequilibrium causes an acceleration. Yeah, think of it as an entropic that's... property. Yeah, that's why your egg was just floating in the water, right? And then you added salt to it, increasing the density of it. Now you've got two different densities trying to clash with each other. And what has to happen? The lighter, <laughs> the, the object in the, de in the denser medium goes up. Perfect. 
With that, I'll say if you are watching this on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Premiering Streams, then stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow. Unfortunately, if you are watching this live, this is where we bid you farewell. A huge, massive, enormous thank you to all of you who smashed the super chat, liked, commented, shared, subscribed, and all that good stuff. Be sure to check out NathanOakley.com and the Flat Earth Debate Forum to keep up to date with the community debate. I've been Nathan Oakley. Stay tuned if you're watching on a Premiering Stream, and I'll see you all in the next video. Salt to it, increasing the density of the the water. And right, right. That. But no, that's right. But I just want to go somewhere once I get an answer from them. Um, if you my, think of it with like why a boat floats on water, it's more like if you're changing the density, the water's structural support is changing. That's why when you're in different oh, solutions sounds, of water, it changes. Adam sounds like flat huh? What? Adam. <laughs> no, <at least> that's <laughs> <not true. laughs> Yeah, it will when return the, back. You you add energy to the system. You agitate it. You take but by adding that energy, you take the particles out of the the natural equilibrium they were in before you pick the bottle up, yeah. um, and then eventually, with entropic entropy, it will return to its lower, not to the same state because they're all different particles. They'll order differently, but they'll all go down and get try to reach their lowest energy state now. That might actually form a slightly higher column next time because the way the particles interact and form a rest. So you can get, it's not always, there can be enough structure. So the way a flake might fall and then allow another flake to sit on top of it, as opposed to taking up the minimum volume, it, 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 there's enough structural support in one of the flakes to hold that plate there and take that density buoyancy and put it, it Put it into a rest, so it will arrest the the, the equilibrium. It doesn't so, mean if you remove the flake underneath, the one above will then continue on its journey because it would do, because there's no longer anything arresting it. Right. So the acceleration that everyone's talking about is you shaking it, you oh. causing it. The it's acceleration that you're the secondary acceleration is uh, is an entropic effect after you've inputted energy and disrupted the system. Right, that's, so what I'm saying is we've all done it. We've shaken uh, salad mixtures before. So uh, if it's just sitting there, it's at equilibrium because it sat there for a month, let's say, and found rest. I pick it up, I start shaking it, I'm adding energy to the system. Then uh, I put it back at rest because I didn't use it all. Now it's doing what? It's looking to get to equilibrium, find rest again. Yeah, and the way in which it will do that in order is via relative density. That's how. Right, so it's not acceleration. The only thing you could even come close to saying acceleration is when I added energy. I don't like the term acceleration. Um, okay, even better. Neither do I. Same goes for force. Um, I don't know if you've seen Dr. John D's draft presentation that he's thinking about putting out. Pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty out there. And in many ways, I agree with him. In some ways, I do disagree with him, although I haven't told him this yet, because he's describing how we have reified a concept. And in some ways, yes, that's absolutely true. But in other ways, it isn't. It's being used as a describer. It's a description mm -hmm. of something that's occurring. And to say that something has a force applied to it in descriptive terms can be accurate. Now, in reality, he's saying, well, no, there's no force applied. There is no force. And I'm thinking, the more I read it, because I read it through twice, I'm like, I don't find any flaw with this. I don't know about you, Adam. What, what were your thoughts on it? I've got to, <laughs> I've got the final one to read through to, to Mark. I've given him some feedback on it, and it's, it's hard work. It's really hard work because, yeah, because I suppose fundamentally, 
he's probably correct. Um, but there, there has to you become a bit sophist if not. You've got to you've got to have a defining word for it. And the, the only thing I would differentiate there's a difference between that, which is like I say, going a little bit too far, I think, uh, because we do need to be able to to describe things. But ah, that's interesting. That was yeah. my objection. Well, we need yeah. this, don't we? Well, that, that, well, other than if that, we objection... haven't got this, then we need to define it so we have got ways of describing it. Is is my only point. If we're going uh, to be... I thought that, that too. So, so what you're saying is, <laughs> like a baller. This is exactly my thoughts. I'm agreeing with you. That's that. I haven't put this yeah. to paper yet for him, but yeah. So, unless we've got an alternative description, <laughs> so... no, 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 we've got to. We well, we've got to then consider then how we're going to describe things um yeah if we're not going to use this term and if we're going to poo poo it and say it it means everything and nothing which is kind of what john's saying um it means you know i mean so then how do we move forwards um is is my point i'm not saying you have to invade an alternative paradigm but you've got to come up with something solid to move forward from um, and what he's saying is the, the base of where we came from isn't solid. Um, so, And I agree. And the problem with that is you're right, because if you don't have these semantic descriptions for things, you can't describe them anymore. So you're saying, well, we'd still need to land on a, a newer, better, whatever description for it. But that still leaves, with, based on his argument, the problem with that is that you could still slip in the new description into his exact same argument, couldn't you, based on semantics? I think some of what he's doing is, is differentiating this this term energy, um, chemical, physical. It's all as if, and I'm, I think what he's the underlying point isn't necessary to to break down. He's not saying that like, chemical energy doesn't equate correctly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He's kind of saying, what the hell is this energy? What is this energy you speak of? Yeah, because fundamentally, in the <laughs> ways we use it in different areas, um, it's different thing. So energy in a chemical reaction, is that the same? How does that turn into kinetic energy and then back? Or where does it go when it's lost, when we're pushing an object? Yet energy's never lost. Amount. So what is this fundamental thing, the energy in its most definitive unit? What is it that's being transferred is the question John's asking. Right. And he's and saying when you get... fundamentally the design, we're starting with a, a fundamentally wrong premise because we try to quantify it in a particular area. Right. It's overgeneralized when you use energy or force. Whereas if you said kcals or joules or momentum or spin or something of that nature, you can qualify it a bit more specifically. But you've still got a semantic term that you could say, well, your description of how something's turning about an axis, that's not really spin. Spin doesn't exist. And it's like, well, no, it's just an abstraction. It's just a description of something that you can physically show, though. And when it comes to physically showing the energy... I found very little to find flaw with his description of how it doesn't actually exist. I've got to be honest, I just couldn't... I, like I say, I haven't read the most recent revision of it, but I'm scratching my head and trying to apply after the fact of going, well, we need this, don't we? <laughs> after that, I'm like, well, in if it was a baller presenting a baller argument, I would turn around to them and say, I don't need to provide an alternative. I can just show where it's wrong. And that's all he's doing, right? He's just showing how it's wrong. Yeah. So, So yeah. from that perspective, I think... Go ahead, man. More power to you. It's gonna be it's gonna be eye opening to a lot of people on both sides. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think that's the point. He's not. He's not. He is just. He's just destroying. I've told him. He's just wrecking shit. <laughs> 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 he's not. <laughs> he's not postulating a, an alternative to this. He's just pointing out some of the fundamental errors or, or assumptions that are made that we. As we criticise stuff, maybe we go back more fundamentally that uh, there are issues there. Whether you decide to accept them and or not is is kind of irrelevant. But it's 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 a very interesting read to go. Oh bloody hell! Indeed, because yeah. because <laughs> to summarise it, you're in, you're in a position where the fundamentals don't match what what is being described. That's the, that's the basic point he's making, and he's correct. Now, when you've got that problem, you've got two issues that follow it. One. You can either say, well, I can abandon this and then we'd have to go back to basics and get a good understanding of the fundamentals of what energy or uh, force actually is and contextualise it with different circumstances like I just did with momentum or spin or calories or whatever else, joules, that you're going to use to qualify it. But if you accept that, then for the time being at least, 
what you've got nothing right you haven't got anything you're just accepting your complete limited lack of understanding of the fundamental basics that you're trying to describe so therefore you've not got you've not got anything to describe them with anymore so suddenly they're scratching your head going well i can't really i could use the old description it's a bit like the paradigm they're left with when you realize that the laws of motion of newton were not right well well how do you describe those things well anthony's used them on this show <laughs> so they're still <laughs> useful but they're used in practical application even though they've been superseded so there's a hundred years later i might add at least a base level understanding that those descriptions don't work. But yeah, a lot of them still carry into current vernacular and descriptions about forces, energy. And it's like, yeah, we still haven't actually got back to the fundamental basics of what these things are. We're just using our cruel, blunt instruments to describe them. And an objection to the, the pointing out by Dr. John D that we still don't have a basic understanding of what it really is, is to say, well, we're going to have to stop describing them in our crude way then. Oh no, I'm going to have to put down my blunt tool. Do I care? Do I really care? Do you care, Adam? No, no, no. It's, it, no I, I just pulled it, I've just pulled it up because I have promised him I'll read it this afternoon or all of it again. Um, but, and I won't share anything other than the title. And I think the title describes it. Exactly. Motion and the reification of energy. Oh, um, so I think that summarises it best. It's this reification of, of energy. I mean, in Discord we was did, trying to get stuck in. Go, go ahead, whoever it was in Discord that was trying to ask something. Thank you, Adam. Yes, yes, Nathan and Adam. Hi, um, I'm Aaron Mist. And when you guys said uh, that you don't like the word acceleration, would disbursement be a better term, or does it really matter? Dispersion yeah. is an entropic effect. The reason I say I don't like acceleration is because F equals NA, um, and the A is based on G, providing the a um and as i've said we, we don't really have any sample sizes that really do demonstrate bound garden is the best and that that if you have a i've got a 10.4 at one point um looking at some of the data ages ago i, I would stand by that but i did some crude maths and it's coming at 10.8 meters per second at one point of the fall so there's there's no there's no for me it's again it's an assumption that Yes, in some cases, F e does equal MA. If we accelerate something, it will match up that. But in terms of the real world and when we're talking about stuff falling that's denser than the medium it's in, I don't see this A, this acceleration, as a constant that you can apply to it to the real world. It may hold true in some of the small areas where we're dropping stuff, but that doesn't reify an acceleration. It just says this, over this area, we could say it's accelerated from this to this. It doesn't necessarily mean there's a there has to be an applied force that's generating that. It just means it takes that long to get to that speed and this small impedance. So to me, there isn't necessarily an A in that fact that that A comes from an applied force. Does that makes sense. I agree. I don't like the word acceleration myself. Yeah. I'm just wondering for a better word. Well, then Anthony say density disequilibrium the systems work to return to equilibrium how, how would you say that without applying what you're not trying to apply okay. hey everybody could, could i say something on it uh, whatever when you have a chance see if there's an answer for tenth question first just say a oh. change in velocity uh, i i was asking adam do you want to repeat your question, please turn yeah, to Yeah, say again. I didn't, I didn't hear. Yeah, I said uh, density disequilibrium, Anthony was saying, the system wants to return to equilibrium. <laughs> so uh, how, how would we say that other than the way uh, Anthony said it, which makes sense to me because I used a salad oil bottle as an example. It's sitting there, it's resting until I add energy and shake it. And if I leave it alone, it's going to go back to a similar state. What's the question? Fundamentally, it's entropy, isn't it? Those those flakes at the top want to. Well, we've got a higher energy state up there than they have down there, and they want to return there entropically. And so that's their motivation. If that's what you're getting at, if so if you're looking at well, I, driving force, they're the best I could say would be entropically. 
that's a lower energy state and it's more favorable and if that's available to it it will seek that right but you said earlier you don't like to use the word acceleration or force or so how what would you what would you substitute it with a, a velocity is fine uh, a speed yeah a changing speed i don't like the term it, over that small amount of time you could calculate that 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 as an acceleration but does it mean it's it's constantly accelerating or does it mean when you point you introduce it to density disequilibrium and the forces play out that there is a changing speed over that play out yeah i get it there is definitely i watched it it's the same thing <laughs> we're describing but fundamentally from a different perspective you see if you have to apply an acceleration or it's just playing out and you can measure its changes it accelerating and decelerated over this time or it, it do you see what I'm, it's, in everything you've got terminal velocity so then you get a d you know is it I don't think you can claim that. No, bloody claim. Brian? Yeah, I think I got my answer. Thanks. Perfect. Brian? Thanks, Nathan. <clears throat> yeah, I've been listening, and uh, the whole thing about this force and acceleration that people keep on adding to this, people keep on trying to add uh, stuff to this when it's very simple. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to give an explanation of it. The, the effect is relative density. The cause is simply just matter. Matter is physical. Now, the directionality, uh, the vector directionality of that matter depends on the density of it and the medium, which is also matter, that it's in. So the, the statement that it fell because I picked it up is not 100% true. Because he, helium and hydrogen don't fall. You don't need to pick them up. It fell because there's not enough, and I've said this before, there's not enough structural support for it within the medium. If there was structural support, it wouldn't fall, it would float. You know, or it would suspend. But why does your phone fall to the floor? The gases around it can't support it. Yeah. And the so density of matter of your phone can't be supported by the gases around it. Yeah, why, does, uh, why, does, why does a helium balloon go up? Because it, it can be supported by the gases around it. Yeah, including the, the balloon. That's, that's yeah. the same as Sleeping Warrior's explanation where he's saying that things have to move out of the way of other things, or the flakes in Adam's example. Yeah, but I'm, I'm giving it a cause, and the cause is just matter. Because even in descriptive terms, the least dense... Um, the substance we know of, that I'm aware of, is hydrogen. And hydrogen is described as one proton and one electron, which is, which is just one positive, one negative charge. Now, as an atom, now we can't see these things. So it's just a descriptive, a descriptive thing. The next least dense uh, matter after that is helium. And helium is two protons, two electrons, and two neutrons, if I remember correctly. Uh, uh, neutrons are just what? Innate matter. So if you look at the molecular uh, weight of gases, the more innate matter, the more neutrons something has, it's mostly neutrons and protons that give it weight, the gas of weight. If you want to call it a weight, I know you can't weight it. I know it doesn't behave like it has a weight, but if you want to call it that, just for descriptive terms. But it's neutrons. The, key, the more neutrons, which is just innate matter. Neutrons aren't positive or negative charges, just neutrons, just innate matter. Innate matter gives it weight, gives something weight. What do you think? Other than weight is equivocated with down by them, i.e. gravity. Yeah, I see what you, I know what you're driving at. You've said it before, and I agree. Okay, then. <laughs> Thanks. Virus, did you have something to add? Brian? You talking to me? I oh, heard Brian. you pipe up. I didn't know if you wanted to add something. Oh, uh, um... No, not really, but... Okay, so with the whole... You know, you could just... So are y'all basically saying that that density provides things with weight and not gravity like how are y'all how are y'all doing the whole density thing and applying it with weight i'm curious 
Who's going to feel that? that, Nathan? Yeah, feel free, Brian. Thanks. Well, as I, as I just described, the least dense substance we know is hydrogen. How come the least dense substance we know will always rise up? Well, well you know, it, it always will attempt to rise up. In our atmosphere, it won't because we have, it's constantly in flow, in motion, in motion, so it's homogeneous. But uh, if you put different gases of different molecular weights, which is densities, into a container and leave it there statically at a constant temperature, they will align themselves due to their density. You know, so the more, like, it can't be just, it can't be just a coincidence that the more dense something is, the more likely it is to go down if the medium is less dense than it. That's relative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, relative. That's, that's relative. Yeah. Okay, that's I was just crazy. wondering. No, I was just asking. Because I was really curious. I'd like to see what y'all come up with. So this is interesting to me. Anybody else want to add something? Brian, I saw your light flashing. I don't know if you were just off mute. No? Fair enough. Yeah, I yeah I want to say something. Um, Go ahead. So it seems like based on what we're talking about, there's three criterias, and I could be wrong, but uh, I'm going to throw it out: temperature, static condition, and containment. Is there any more than that? Those are those are measurable things, but the antecedent would be the container. The other things are just measurements, arbitrary constructions that we've devised to explain things. In terms of what our skin feels if you're talking about the temperature qualified with thermometers and various other things but it's arbitrary but the antecedent consequent relationship is going to be always you know it's not something that even requires qualifying mathematically because if you do you can do what professor dave did and just say well i'll just create a hypothetical container but a hypothetical container doesn't contain gas so you still have it as an antecedent in reality whereas the temperature is kind of inconsequential it's just a, a description of something that we want to impose on it a number and it's so what it doesn't it's not an antecedent to have temperature but you can qualify what the temperature is based on how much gas there is in a given volume i'm talking more of uh how it causes gases to behave so the if it's cold gases behave a certain way if it's hot my two and a half gallon or five gallon gas plus a gas tank is i mean i got a relief pressure I got to open the valve and all this, you know, pressure comes out. Sure. If it's cold, it sinks in on itself. It constricts on itself. Yeah, you're right. It's, the it's, it's, you're describing what's described in Boyle's law. And you're correct. But I'm still saying that regardless of whether or not you're in your specific example with a chamber that's being heated up by the sun and then the pressure's increasing, the overall behavior of the gas is, is exactly the same. And Adam was trying to allude to this earlier in his description. He's saying, well, yeah, you can have it described as moving faster, but is that an acceleration? Well, no, it's got a constant speed and the system itself that it's occupying will have a variant on the amount of total energy that the gas has got in terms of the amount of pressure it puts on the force on the walls of the container. So, yeah, you could describe that as increasing in acceleration, but it's really sloppy. In well, I was more bringing this up is if, if you're going to study it and say test it in many ways, uh, you're, you're going to use one, if not all of these things, and each one done differently will give you different results. Yeah, but regardless of the temperature, all of them will always require containment. So the antecedent Absolutely. to the gas isn't the, isn't the temperature it's at. Yeah, I wasn't at all stating you can do any of these uh, tests uh, without a container because that'd be impossible. That's why Hillbilly Blue Ball showed up with containers. Indeed. The main overriding antecedent consequent relationship is the requirement for the gas to have containment so that you can start qualifying what's the temperature going to be, what's the pressure going to be. And all of those things are going to be described with things like Boyle's Law and they're going to have containment in the equation. Volume. Thanks, Nathan, Adam, and Ten for that. Pleasure. Is there anything else? Discord?
bit of Brian Logic background Unless, noise. Of course, somebody could tell us how we could have gas pressure without a container. Anybody? Yeah, so can anybody actualize not a Professor Dave's hypothetical chamber in reality? Can anybody actualize that? Virus, this is your side. Maybe you could help us here. Well, yeah, so what are you trying to do? Make an do you understand Dave's He's example to... before we go on? Oh, so, oh, okay. so are you trying to make an experiment based off what you said that one doctor said about the bouncy ball things in a fish tank? You're trying to make something no. that's related to that? No. So Professor Dave, as is known on YouTube, has expressed that you don't need containment. You can have a hypothetical container, just a given volume on paper, an amount of space on paper without any walls. That you're just going to calculate the gas pressure inside the hypothetical container now even in his maths he's got a container it's just described as hypothetical but i'm asking is there any way that that could be actualized made real shown in physicality that you don't need a container to have the gas pressure that he's calculating hypothetically um it depends on how much gas pressure you're trying to reach maybe you can any. get a very heavy gas that might settle at a different at a different pressure and just pour it on the floor. There aren't any gases that do that. If you're talking about a so gas has... suspended in a different gas with a differential of pressure, it makes no odds in terms of entropy. The gas will still expand in all directions without containment to fill the availability of volume with time. Entropy is proportional to time. So you're saying, well, we might be able to demonstrate it if I take two different gases. Well, okay. The do first all... gas... Okay, so here's... Here's a question. Does all elements mix together? Or are there elements that don't mix together? All right. Can Professor Dave's example that you don't need a container, hypothetically on paper, he can calculate it. Can that be done in reality? Can you have the hypothetical container in reality without walls, without actual containment, even though he's describing it with the antecedent required for gas, which is a container, hypothetical or otherwise? Can you do that in reality? No. Maybe if you get something that's very, very heavy and pour it onto the floor, it'll stay. <laughs> but that's, what, but that's yeah. what I'm thinking. So, that's why so I asked no, the question, the same though, response. Does all elements mix together. Are there elements that don't mix? Sorry. No, no. Not, not a gas poured through another gas in reality. Just a gas without a, a container. Like he's just... Stay. Go on, Elijah. Yeah. Go on, Elijah. What? Elijah, have you just got your mic wide open? Elijah. I think he was trying to talk. Uh, I think he was roboting. Oh, no. I was just saying, uh, am I roboting? You good now? Go ahead. All right. Sorry. No, I was, I was just saying you, you can't even mop a floor and expect it to stay wet. What are you talking about? Of course, that's how water works. But that's why I was asking, is there an element that doesn't fuse with other elements? No. Gas expands to fill the volume. Even if you try and expand a gas into a non-container, with time, it will still fill the volume. Because with the experiment that I... Well, I guess with the d demo that I'm thinking in my head, you could probably get something that that's not normally a gas at room temperature. Heat it up to where it's a gas, but then nah, it'll, it'll float if you heat it up. So that ruined that. Never mind. Just, <laughs> just a just no thinking. would have that, done. That ruined it automatically. So, that okay. ruined it. As soon as you heat it up, it's going to want to rise anyway. So Okay, it would anyway. That's how gas behaves. But basically, Professor Dave is wrong. Hypothetically, on paper, isn't reality. It's not showing it. It's not an example. It's not physically capable of doing that. Gas doesn't behave in such a manner that you can put an arbitrary line around it and say, stay. The gas doesn't do that, it just expands to fill the volume. So he's wrong. Hypothetically, you can do it on paper, but hypothetically, isn't physical gas not expanding because you put an arbitrary line around it? Exactly. Like you say many times, Nathan. I can draw a unicorn fart on paper, but I can't smell a unicorn fart in reality. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a <first>. virus <laughs> uh, that's a good one that's a good one uh, hold on hold on, no, Go ahead, I like that one. 
Hold on, Virus. Brian's got a question for you. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, thanks, Nathan. Uh, Virus, the, the problem with, uh, besides the, the, the basic thing uh, about gas behaviour, the problem with uh, Pro- Professor Dave's um, uh, imaginary container that's based on mathematics, that's all pre-assuming that life could form originally in a vacuum. Then that's the problem. How do you make, how does life form within a vacuum? That's what the starting of the heliocentric model is, that life forms within a vacuum. It, it can't. Because if it doesn't have, yeah. if it doesn't have pressure, there's no chemical process, so how could life form in a vacuum? Exactly. Let, so let, let the, the point, virus answer that. Virus, so virus, your example started with you pouring a specific gas of a greater density through a gas that's already pre-existing. Yeah. And the point is that our argument is specifically about how we have gas pressure at all if the sky is a vacuum. So where do you get the gas pressure from for your example in the first instance? Because without a container, you, could, you couldn't have the gas to pour a different gas through to show a differential that would inevitably just prove our point true anyway with time because entropy is proportional to it. Hmm. I don't know. I ain't got that deep into it yet. I was thinking, I was making my way to there, but then I thought about once you add the heat, it's going to want to rise anyway because it's going to want to expand. So Excellent. That kind Excellent. of defeated the whole purpose, though. Correct. So, so okay. But the problem, the problem, I'm about to say the prop, the real problem is keeping the substance pure and keeping it from mixing with the other elements. What about mixing, what about mixing, mixing with, the, with the, what about filling the space? Not too much of a deal if it's a heavy gas. The, uh, uh, heavy that's, gas. Not, that's not the problem I was uh, Sorry, about. I My covered this. Hold pure. on, virus. I covered this already. Doesn't mm-hmm. matter what type of gas. That's what all gases will do. They'll all fill the availability of volume without exception. Now you're saying, now if I just assume we've already got a gas pressure and I start introducing different densities of gas to that gas pressure that's pre existing, no, that doesn't help you because we're saying. How would you have the gas in the first place if the sky was a vacuum? That's a space for it to fill. And you're saying, well, not if it was heavy. No, no, gases don't fall down, go boom, boom. They expand to fill the volume. And come back down. They don't always, they don't stay up. That's why it's not oxygen all the way up. Oh, my bad. So you see pools and puddles of gas, do you? You can make a puddle of gas with butane. But it'll blow away. <laughs> so with time, entropy oh. so entropy would mean that it would describe how it would fill the space eventually. Yeah, and it filling the space when there's pre-existing gas pressure doesn't alter the fact that there's a massive amount of space claimed to be our sky that the gas isn't filling. Therefore, the sky isn't a vacuum because the gas would fill it. That's what gas does. So as the gas expands into the vacuum, is entropy going up or down? Up. While it's expanding. Up. It's going up. Yeah, it's an entropy increase you're describing. Okay. I was, I was, I was wondering. Yeah, entropy decreasing would be a second law of thermodynamics violation, bro. I have a house. Can you know it would No, it wouldn't. Yes, us it would. Vi- no, it doesn't. Show us an example. Really? Yeah, it does. Show, show us. Your refrigerator. Uh, it's okay. Show us gas that's expanded, right, going back to I'm where not, it came I'm from. I'm going to give you an example where it goes down, and that's a freezer. It gives its it, it gives its entropy to the <laughs> to refrigerator the outside of the freezer. <laughs> refrigerator. Um, no, that's <laughs> entropy. No, let me just answer him. Don't laugh at him. No, you're slowing the effects of entropy. No, you're decreasing no. entropy inside of the freezer and giving it out into the room. That's why the room gets hot while it gets cold inside the freezer. <laughs> no, you, you can't <laughs> reverse the effects. You can't have entropy traveling back backwards. You can slow the effects of entropy, like putting butane in a pipe. You'll slow down the effects, but it's still going to increase with time. The rate of increase, so, you can slow down, but that's so, not that's not reversing so if- entropy. You're, you're outside. Okay, this is category error to begin with. Um, okay. Entropy laws. But that's what, I'm what is that? What is that? Ahead, Second law of thermodynamics, right? Second law of thermodynamics is a natural law. How many refrigerators you see when you walk outside in woods? <laughs> I mean, man-made things still got to go by the laws of thermodynamics, too. 
No, that's I'm not saying that. That's a red herring fallacy. The second law of thermodynamics is a natural law. You're using something everything. that temporarily halts or temporarily decreases entropy. That has nothing to do with the second law. As soon as you invoke that refrigerator, which is tear jerk and belly laugher, by the way, uh, it's outside second law parameters. Naturally, gases will expand to fill the volume, period. Yeah, but it follows thermodynamics. It follows thermodynamics. That's how it we follow knew how dynamics. To freeze it still follows thermodynamics, my refrigerator. You're an idiot. Yeah, it does. You don't know it what natural low. laws are. You don't know what the law of entropy is. You second you don't know what the second law is. What entropy never decreases inside of a an isolated system? And also <laughs> the heat. I mean the work that you do is only transfer into the energy on the heat. Like Let's try isolated systems. Hold on, Huey. Hold Do you on. know the hold on. Part? Hold on. Second law of thermodynamics. Let him give his response without totally rumpusing him. Right or wrong? I'm just not saying. rumpusing him. No, not he's just everyone. parroting friggin' wiki. I know he is. Do isolated no, systems start here? Do I'm isolated even... systems exist in nature? I don't know what wiki says about this this whole thing. <laughs> I, That's not what you're being asked. You've been. He's asked you. Do isolated systems exist in nature? No. If if there was, it were only then why one. Are you in, then why are you invoking it? And why is it in the I'm explanation not. of a natural I'm just, law? I'm just, I'm just stating law. I'm just stating part of the law. But can I <laughs> give Can I give him an example? Let me give him an example. Virus. Let's say you have a cup of water and you pour it on the floor, and then you take the same amount of cup of water, pour it onto a saucepan, and turn up the heat. Uh, which analogy there which part will evaporate sooner the one on the floor or the one with the heat applied to it the one you're adding energy to them okay and then if you come a day later will the one on the floor eventually have uh, done the same thing as the one you applied with the heat gone away yeah it evaporates i mean that's, that's okay the way thank water you works. Yeah, thank it, you yeah, that's all. do you understand there's no reversible processes in nature right amen do you understand amen. that so so, so if you, so if, if so, gas, so the, I mean, if I'm entropy is going is up as the gas expands, only, what happens to entropy what as I'm the gas What I'm trying to say is, just shut up for a second. What I'm trying to say is that nature moves only one way. Increase in entropy. This is well-established junior high level physics. So when a gas expands, it entropy goes up. What happens when it condenses? What happens when what condenses? Yes. Asking is a, he's asking if the phase change is an entropy decrease. That's what I think he's asking. Oh, phase changes. Yeah, you're 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 essentially numpty. No, no, just answer him. Is a phase change a decrease in entropy? Not just any phase change. You can't but use a phase it. change from a You got to go into that's why I asked liquid. him. Oh my oh god. god. That's why I asked him what the equation was for second law of thermodynamics because we're going to eventually get to Gibbs free yeah. energy. And of course, he thinks delta G is a disco band from the 70s, so we're out here playing with no, friggin' no. numpties. No, no. Well, that's just testing. Yeah. You, what's delta G? Not you. I, I really don't know. I guess it would be the, the delta G would be that what is that the change in entropy? I don't think that's a change in entropy. No, W would be worse. No, they got to number uh, one. We made sure. them on their level. I'm not sure about the symbols. Ruin my joke. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I ain't never heard the joke. I would have went with it if I knew it was a joke. I'm sorry. Got to number one with Baydem on the Your Love thing in 1974. I'm going to have to look that up. I'm curious. Okay, never heard of it. say it's fine. You don't know what delta G Gibbs free energies passed you by. Fine. You have to take enthalpy into account, right? In those particular situations with phase changes, yeah, you'll see it's still entropy de increase of the surroundings. Yeah, so, no, that's so, what I was yeah. saying about the freezer. You can't. Oh my god. I, I I can't do this. Well, you've had to, you've had to, you've had to, you've had to, man's just out of the virus. Start over at, at, pre, at preschool. 
Sorry. Then virus. go up through. Okay, this well, time, pay attention. Okay, right? And then the drop arms. anchor. Hello. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to answer Please. him with Tenth Man's example. So Tenth Man gave an example to you, Virus. Do you remember what the example was first? Just need a yes or no. Yep. Perfect. So he's got a cup, water evaporating at a very slow rate. A slow rate of entropy increase versus a fast rate of entropy increase. They're both entropy increase. But if you start with the boiling version and then go to the one that's taking a long time, does that mean it's a decrease in entropy or just a slower rate of entropy increase? No, it's still evaporating. It's not going the other way. It's not freezing. Right. So ice, what? bearing in mind, you can't get to absolute zero. The molecules have still got a certain amount of movement. Do you think that that's exactly. a decrease in entropy? Yeah, I figured it's condensing something would be the opposite of no expanding. So I just figured it'd be opposite. No, it's not. It's just a decrease in the rate of entropy. So you're slowing the rate. So not reversing it. What a sublimation. What a sublimation. So the nature is that a question? Okay. So that's a question for me. Adam might ain't be able to answer that. So I think I might be saying it wrong. Sublimation. No, uh, I, I have a question. What if you put that cup of water in Antarctica? Is it going to evaporate? Might do. If there was a bit of sun Ever? on it. Yeah. If it you, could do, if you, certainly. If you have it open to the open sky, then yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that it's reversed its entropy direction. It's still got exactly. an entropy increase occurring. Yeah, you can have a, a tray full of ice cubes in the freezer eventually evaporate if not used. I already yeah, went over a... this. <laughs> I already went over this. Not enough. And when I told, not when I told Tag Cabral. Dave, if you're, just hold off. Just hold off. No, we, well, we're talking about a freezer, about... though. Oh, oh my open God. Why, why is this happening? I mean, I'm being serious. Why is this happening, right? For, for what, half an hour, two hours, whatever it's been? The panel managed to have a decent conversation without everyone talking over each other. We introduced virus for 10 minutes and everything's getting talked over and I'm having to intervene non-stop. <laughs> wow. I'm sorry if I caused that. I'm sorry. It's my fault. The no, virus you're not is sorry. You're I'm not. You're not sorry. I'm not. You just say he'd be sorry or not. You don't know his mind. Well, virus. All I'm, all I'm well, doing is let's get out of this natural freezer. Let's get dog. out of this. Listen, this is a Professor Dave issue, right? So go to onto my channel. Go to the Professor Dave toe tag, and I go over this step by step with the phase change of water, and the delta G is positive. That means it's spontaneous. So you have to know delta G. You have to take into account enthalpy. You don't know what the second law of thermodynamics is. That's the problem. Because you have to take the system and the surroundings into this, into the equations, right? That's why you don't know. The delta G or the, I'm delta G. The change in entropy of the universe equals the change of entropy of the system plus the change in entropy of the surroundings is greater than zero. You have to know that equation. This is like talking neurosurgery to a three-month-old. So that's why everyone's getting confused and discombobulated because you don't know what you're talking about, essentially. Amen. Thanks. Thank you. Coming from the key person who doesn't know what they're talking about. Was that muttering under your breath? Okay. I know, that was someone else just agreeing, I think. Uh, yes. I oh, I think he was challenging QED. Yeah. Yeah, could you repeat that? Whoever muttered, muttered that? Could you repeat that for me? Virus, feel free. No, it wasn't virus, it was somebody else. No, it wasn't virus, it was someone else, but I couldn't make out what he was saying. Okay, first lawyer, go ahead. That was Mr. Solaris, not me. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> Let the next defendant stand up, please. Yeah, so you wasn't me. Innocent. Yeah, he said comment, that's coming from the key person who doesn't understand, referring to QE. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's an ad hoc. Oh, uh, I see. That's what I thought I heard. That's why I asked for a re repetition. Oh, then, Solaris, t tell us where he's wrong. First lawyer, can you go on mute, please?
Mr. Solaris. <laughs> Sorry. No? Nothing? <laughs> Who wants to shout at the title? Guess it was just the wind. <laughs> 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 that, was, that, that was funny. Good one, Neil. It, it always sounds like he's screaming from halfway across the room. I'm in. The, I'm on construction side. I'm. I'm QE's manager. Who wants to shot at the title? <laughs> Nobody. They just want to have a little jab and aren't run away. To, aren't you supposed to say "Eat lightning and craft thunder" at this point? Having a jab and then running away. Is there no yeah, one? Yeah, I don't like that. That's why I said, who wants a shot at the title? Speak up. Could I, could I say something in the meantime? Uh, as I don't know when that guy's going to talk. <clears throat> uh, is that okay, Nathan? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, a virus, I, I've heard you invoke temperature two different times. You can't invoke temperature. Temperature only comes from uh, having a density of gas in some form to give us temperature. It's not just the sun or whatever that's giving us heat or cold. So you can't have temperature unless you have life. How did life form in a vacuum? It has to come back to the original question. You have to be able to show how life can form in a vacuum. So there's no point in talking about a heavy gas that wouldn't mix with other gases, stuff like that or temperatures. You have to show how life can form in a vacuum for any of these things to happen. And that's the problem with the heliocentric model. What do you, what do you have to say about that, Flores? Yeah, you waiting on my reply? Okay, so... How, how, how do you know this for sure? I, I don't think it's the vacuum that's too much of a problem, but the support of water. No, how do you this? have even water? How do you have anything? If if life is supposed to form in a vacuum, how do you, how does water form? How do you get water? How do you get density of gases? How do you get life in a vacuum? Because we have an atmosphere. We're just lucky to got gas that has weight. <laughs> I mean, that would be the answer from the heliocentric model. How do you weight? have any of these things? Wait, wait, wait. Let me ask with you weight. Oh, God. Here we go. <laughs> I know. Can weight <laughs> decrease entropy? What's weight? No, why? I don't know. Why would it? His answer was oh, atmosphere. Brother. That was his answer. Because I so assume... You, so you have a have problem. If, you, if, it, if it doesn't, he has a problem. What's the problem? Why? Why? Gas would fill the space. Not according to the heliocentric model. Yeah, according to... Not atmosphere. using... <laughs> <model. laughs> Okay, yeah, according to uh, your model. There's a lot of things wrong with the heliocentric model. That's just virus. That that's why we're here. If we can have, yeah. virus, welcome. We'll have you name those later, but we ain't got time for all that. Let's just stick with the gas pressure thing. Fine. Why isn't the gas filling the sky vacuum if you think there's not a problem on your model? Wait. Just you just wait. We're asked by Paul, does weight affect entropy? <laughs> Answer no. So gas expands in all directions gas to fill the availability increase. of volume. That's entropy increase. Weight, what, if you put gas into a container and put it on a scale? Yeah, that doesn't affect entropy. Well, I agree. Paris, you said weight doesn't affect entropy. Hmm. It's interesting. I agree. Because a lot of you guys claim that weight does exactly do that. So can I add, <laughs> It actually you decreases know about entropy, the according to you guys. Oh, let's see. That's pretty fun. Okay, thank you. Chocolate, since you know about the globe, what does the globe say about how we satisfy thermodynamics when it comes to our atmosphere? <laughs> globe doesn't say anything. It doesn't. doesn't. What? It doesn't. <laughs> what kind of question is that? That's, bro? that's what we've sure? just asked you. Let me, hold on, guys, guys. I, I know we asked you, Chocolate. So we are asking you, in your model, how does your model cope with the second law of thermodynamics violation that is your sky vacuum? And your response is to say, how does our model Describe the second law of thermodynamics. That's our question to you. <laughs> I mean, I answered your question. I, you answered I asked it. the question. Bro, all you did was repeat our question <laughs> to you. Are, you. are you not aware of that? 
You just asked That's me, how does the globe respond to? That's uh, why you're here. here. Just figured out what's going on. It's how would you explain drift? How would you expect to show 15 degrees an hour of deviation? How would you expect our model to have gas pressure without a container? It's not our model. It's not our claim. It's your claim. You need to demonstrate that your model, without an address to the second law of thermodynamics, a natural law occurring always in nature, why it doesn't address it. And the answer is because the sky is not a vacuum, a la your model. So the globe, the people that came up with <laughs> discovering thermodynamics didn't come up with a reason to why it with the why it you know works with the atmosphere. Oh yeah, they did atmosphere, they, 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 a, 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 atmosphere. What's this? Spherical shaped atmosphere. air. No, that so so no. You're saying they didn't figure out how Does to cope that, with the my friend, please. So you're asking Does us why, work? and he's just gonna fucking talk through me every time I start, isn't he? It's a gap. Shut up! Talking, you right? dumb shit! No, no, Sit no, down and let no, me reply. No. So you're asking us why the second law? I'm going to kick him out. What a cunt? Piss off, virus! You're a wanker. You're an absolute cunt. Thank you. Fuck you. Get out. So he's asking us why the second law of thermodynamics couldn't cope with an assumption that air takes the same shape of a sphere. It doesn't, you dick. That's not something they need to cope with in thermodynamic laws. It's your fundy presupposition based on your bloody model. Not that I'm allowed to address that to him without him constantly interrupting me. Uh, he has to interrupt. Take him off mute so we can berate him again. <laughs> <laughs> no, he'll suffer the uh, entropy Since if you do that. Since you know the globe and you hung out with him last week, <laughs> <laughs> like what the hell? Man? Well, I think I think Brian's question uh, was answered by weight. Brian said, "How do you get everything in the vacuum? Life, you know, anything?" And he says, "Weight." Well, what is weight? What, what the stuff I couldn't get? Now you're weighing stuff you can't get. You can't get stuff and you weighed it. Yeah, well, hold they on. don't know what it, weight is either. Is it? Isn't there a claim that weight? does in fact reverse entropy yes so why would he say that it doesn't because it doesn't while but arguing yes. weight <laughs> yeah that's correct chocolate there so the gas goes down go boom boom like bouncy balls poured into a fish tank with that i'm going to say a huge massive enormous thank you to both google and discord servers for making today's after show possible and of course a massive thank you to all of you in either nathan oakley 1980 or nathan oakley primary streams for hopefully smashing the super chat liking commenting sharing subscribing and all that good stuff be sure to check out nathanoakley.com and the flat earth debate forum to keep up to date with the community debate i've been nathan oakley and i'll see you all in the next video